All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's always nice to see everybody fellowshipping and having a good time. We are going to jump in. I want to try to bang uh, Revelation chapter 9 out in one session. All right. So we're in Revelation, and uh, we are in the third segment of the book that is referred to as After These Things. Revelation is a book of the Bible that gives us its own outline. In Revelation 1, 19, Jesus tells John, write the things that are, which is the vision that he had seen just prior to that verse. Uh, or I'm sorry, write the things you have seen, which is the vision that was just prior to that verse. Write the things that are, which is the seven letters to the seven churches that takes place in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And then write that which will come after these things. And that word in the Greek is metatauta. And coincidentally, Revelation ver uh, chapter 4 verse 1 begins with that same word, metatauta, after these things. And so we take that as our outline of the book. Your homework from last week was as follows. Read Revelation 9. Contrast Revelation 8 and 9 with the Exodus account of the plagues of Egypt. And read Exodus uh, chapter 7 through 12. So that was your assignment. <clears throat> so the plagues of Egypt, they follow a specific pattern. Uh, there is a total of seven warnings that God gives. So not every plague comes with a warning, but seven times within those 10 plagues, we see Mo God through Moses warning Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Um, we see waters turned into blood in Revelation 7, 14 through 25. Uh, frogs on the land and in the homes in, in uh, Exodus, I'm sorry, 8, 1 through 5. Uh, no warning with the plague of lice. Uh, the third warning, warning comes with the flies on the homes in Exodus 8, 20 through 24. Warning number four, disease on cattle in Exodus 9, 1 through 7. Then there's no warning for the boils or the sores on man and beast. The fifth warning comes prior to the thunder and the hail in, uh, in uh, Exodus 9, 18 through 35. Warning number six comes with the locusts in 10, uh, 1 through 20, no warning before the darkness. It just falls upon uh, the, the country. And then warning number seven is the warning before the death of the firstborn. So with that said, you know, we see that Jacob's trouble and affliction is foretold in Isaiah 60 and in Jeremiah 30. Um, there is a cry to God uh, that is heard in Jeremiah 31, 18 through 20, that that is, that is prophesied. And of course, we see that when the prayers of the saints ascend before the altar. And God does command that Israel's oppressors let them go. And, it, it, and it's prophesied that the oppressors that don't let them go will be punished yet again, Isaiah 43 through 6, uh, uh, verse 6. And then it opens up with two witnesses uh, with miracles before their enemies. And of course, Moses and Aaron kind of play that role as they do uh, miracles before their enemies uh, prior to all the plagues starting. Um, the enemies also perform them. And we see in Revelation 13, verses 14 and 15, that the beast and, and uh, the beast's offspring will, uh, um, rather the devil and the beast as the devil's offspring there, will uh, perform miracles and do signs, and so will the false prophet. And then they will be under sore judgments from God, Jeremiah 25, verses uh, 15, and then um, later on. And God will protect his people, as we saw that back in Revelation 7, that God sets apart 144,000 believing Jews for himself, and that a great multitude will come to Christ. We, see, we will see more protections in um, Revelation 12, verse 6, and then in the following chapters as well. Water is turned into blood. We saw that in Exodus, but we also saw that last week when we studied Revelation 8, that uh, one of the trumpets causes waters to be turned into blood. And we see more of that coming up in Revelation 11 and in Revelation 16. Revelation 16 specifically speaks of satanic frogs. And uh, as we'll see very shortly here in Revelation 9, a plague of locusts. Boils in pain, again in Revelation 16. Hailstones from heaven last time in Revelation 8. 
darkness is predicted in Isaiah 6.20 and confirmed will happen in Revelation 16. Um, hearts are hardened. We will see this coming up as we close out Revelation 9 in this session. Death to multitudes takes place in Revelation 9, verse 15. And Israel to be delivered is predicted in Zechariah 14 and Romans 11. So I just kind of set that out to show you that, as is always the case with Hebrew prophecy, it fits a pattern. Hebrew prophecy is not merely a, a telling and a fulfillment. It always fits a pattern. And one of the reasons we can believe that we are, for the most part, looking at Revelation with actual fulfillments is do you think there are any Egyptians that would say that the fulfillments of those plagues were allegorical or just symbolism back in the days? So, jumping in, last time what we covered was the first four trumpets. And uh, as we broke through those first four trumpets, let's take a look at the outline to Revelation 9 so we can see what we're going to have coming up. Verse 1 we will deal with the fifth trumpet, a star fallen from heaven. And then verses 2 through 6, we will deal with locusts from the bottomless pit. Verses 7 through 10 will give us a description of these odd locusts, these, these strange creatures. Verse 11 is then going to reveal the leader of these locusts. And as you'll see, it's actually quite strange that they even have a leader. <clears throat> Verse 12, we'll see that the worst is yet to come. And so that's not great. Verse 13 is the sixth trumpet, which begins with a voice from the altar. And if you remember in um, Revelation 8, this whole series of trumpets started because the martyrs at the altar, they were crying out. The prayers went up from the altar. They mixed with the censer of incense, which was given to an angel, and then it was cast to the earth. Um, so that is the verse, uh, verses 14 through 15. You'll see the angels and their mission. Which angels? Four very specific angels. And then verse 16 through 19 you'll see a description of the army that is led by these angels. And verses 20 through 21, you will see the response of man. So we're going to jump in and just keep pressing ahead. This session is really about Revelation 9 and the fifth and sixth trumpet blasts. That is really what it encompasses. But as we begin to look at this, it's important to realize that, that here we see two demonic armies Supernatural armies have previously appeared in the scripture. This is not new. And I just want to, because we haven't taken the time to teach some of these texts, to take a look at them. Go to Joel 2, 1 through 2. You see, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. They go on to be described, a fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots over mountaintops they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. This sounds like something out of a horror film with zombie creatures scaling walls and breaking into windows and, and you know, doing gymnastic feats that defy gravity as, the, as this army takes over wherever they happen to go. Now, another army that we will see <coughs> at some point is the host of heaven. 
see, because Scripture also speaks of heaven's armed forces, and they are mighty. We see them in 2 Kings 2.11, where horses and a chariot of fire separated Elijah from Elisha when Elijah was taken up into heaven. There's obviously some type of rank and file on the other side of, of uh, eternity in the dimensions that we cannot see. In 2 Kings 6 through 13, when Dothan was besieged by the army of Syria, God opens the eyes of Elisha's servant, and he sees that despite the army that is arrayed around them, there is a great host of forces on he and Elijah's sign. That's where we get that the verse that says, greater are those that are for us than those that are against us. They are standing there, and, and the enemy didn't even realize that they were within the clutches of the heroes the whole time. The Lord Jesus Christ will also be attended by the armies of heaven riding on white horses. These are forces that actually exist. So having set the stage for the supernatural warfare that will unfold, let's look at the fifth trumpet. It is a star that falls from heaven. But before we get into this trumpet, I want to back up to one of the last ones we saw in Revelation 8.12. Uh, actually, no, let's go back to Revelation 8, 10, the third trumpet. And it says, then a third angel sounded. This is uh, the third trumpet. And a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. The name of this star is Wormwood. So notice the pronoun there is the pronoun it. It fell. Okay. As we get into Revelation 9 here, what I want you to see In Revelation 9, verse 1, is it says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Do you see the change in the pronouns? So at that point, point the Bible has given me permission to interpret this sign less literally than we have the previous signs. The pronouns change. I'm guided by what the text actually says. Does that make sense? This stuff is not hard. Okay? So that first star, we interpret that to be some type of cosmological event, some type of something striking the earth that causes that kind of damage. But this star is given a personal pronoun of a male gender. This is some type of entity. This is some type of being. And it is not beyond the realm of, of the biblical text to use a phrase like a star fallen from heaven to give us a angelic being. We have a distinct transition from the physical to the spiritual here. Stars can mean angels in places like Daniel 12, 3, Isaiah 14, 12 through 16. It's got that personal pronoun him. And he is given a key. And remember, he doesn't already possess the key. The key is given to him. Authority is being given to this creature, this, this being, for a specific purpose during a specific season. <clears throat> and he becomes, as we'll see in verse 11, a king over the beings in the pit. His authority is not complete. Remember, in Luke 10, 18, Jesus beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. And one of Satan's titles is what? Can anybody tell me? What does Lucifer actually mean? Morning star. Okay. And so that is not an uncommon term. In fact, if we go to Daniel 12, 1, you'll see it says, At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. At that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This seems to be describing saints. It seems to be describing winners of souls. But these are people who have, by the timing told to us in the verse, progressed to their glorified bodies. Does that mean 
that at some point our future glorified bodies can only be described in the sense of some kind of heavenly luminary. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? Pay attention to this next part. It says, to what were its foundations fastened, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, we know that phrase, sons of God, speaks of angelic beings. We've done that study numerous times. People freak out, you know, when you try to get into the origins of enemy. They say, well, Lucifer wasn't Satan's first name before he fell. We know. Lucifer means morning star. It's an untranslated root from the Latin. That's where it comes from. But apparently he wasn't the only angelic being called a morning star. Jesus himself bears the title of the bright and morning star. So we see this, this lineage here. And so that, this, 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 this history, rather, of angelic beings being linked to heavenly luminaries and falling, but we don't interpret things that way if the pronouns are genderless. When we see the pronoun shift, we begin to change how we interpret things. It's not complicated. <clears throat> Revelation 2, uh, 9, 2 through 3, it says, And he, that star that fell, with that key he was given, opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit, and then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth were given power. Now, we know from one of the previous trumpets, specifically the fourth trumpet, that the sun and the moon and the stars have already been darkened by a third. So when this fifth trumpet hit, there is even more darkness that begins because of the smoke that is rising out of wherever this pit happens to be. And that leads us to look at verses like Jude 1.6. I look forward to doing a commentary on the book of Jude soon. It says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. What is being described here is that somewhere the angels who fell, and this is, this is an allusion to angels who fell earlier in time. Second Peter does the same thing. He alludes to angels that fell in the days of Noah. They were bound for what they did and reserved for judgment during the great day. And what most people think of when they read that, which is a, is a correct context, I'm not disputing it, but is that those, that those angels won't be judged for their sins until the last day. I submit to you that they've been reserved to reap or wreak judgment on the world in the last day when they are released from this pit, because that's what we're seeing play out in Revelation chapter 9. Yes, they will ultimately be judged, but there's some judging that they're going to be used to do prior to. So what is this bottomless pit? Well, this pit seems to be a place where mighty terrors are awaiting release. So this pit is called in Greek the abuso. Abuso is where we get the English term abyss. Okay? <clears throat> it means a bottomless, unbounded pit. It can liter literally be translated the immeasurable depth. Okay? And what do we know about it? Well, you could say, there goes the neighborhood. This phrase is used nine times in the New Testament, just about 30 times in the Old Testament, and seven times in the book of Revelation. And it specifically is linked to these angels that sinned in Genesis 6, 2, and verse 4, 2 Peter 2, 4, and where we just read in Jude 6. Demons are terrified of being cast into the abuso. They recognize Jesus before he's declared himself in his public ministry, and they say, we know you are the Christ. 
And in Luke 8, 31, where do they not want to go? Don't cast us out. Don't send us to the pit. They know they have an eternal destiny to be somewhere that they do not want to be. Instead, they beg to be cast into some pigs, right? After many days, this abuso will be visited, Isaiah 24, 21 through 22. And according to Revelation 20, 10, Satan will be imprisoned in this pit for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. It is not the, their ultimate destination. The lake of fire is their ultimate destination. Now, I don't know what spiritual exit ramp you get off, but apparently this one's one stop before the last one. Okay? <clears throat> Orcus was a god of the underworld and a punisher of broken oaths in Italic and Roman mythology. It is likely that he was translated from the Greek daemon Horkos, the personification of oaths and a son of Eris. A very deep gulf or chasm in the lowest parts of the earth used as the common receptacle of the dead and especially the abode of demons. We see this written about in Herodotus. Herodotus, excuse me. So Revelation 9, 4 says, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who did not have the seal of God on their forehead. So we see that this, this demon did not have, this, this fallen star rather, this fallen angel that has given the key to the pit, he did not have the authority to open it in and of himself. His authority is not complete, but when, when these hordes are released from the pit, they do not have complete authority to destroy whatever they want to destroy. We previously saw in the first trumpet that there was destruction on the grasses and on the vegetation. So rather than wiping out the planet and making it impossible to grow anything at this point, they're forbidden from destroying the grass of the earth or any green thing. In fact, they're giving very specific targets here. The only people they are allowed to target are those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And I submit to you, those people are the ones we saw in Revelation chapter 7, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel and a great multitude who finds Christ these demons aren't going to be the ones that martyr them. People are the ones that martyr them. The Antichrist system is going to be the ones that martyrs them. But if you're sealed by God, these spirits can't touch you. 2 Timothy 2.19 gives us an indication of what the seal might be. It says, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, this verse often tells me, we've, we've got people who go around right now and, and say that they attend this church or that church every week, but they have a political agenda or a world view that is contrary to the worldview of the scriptures. One of them may look really worshipful singing the last verse of Amazing Grace while Garth Brooks does his stuff at the inauguration, you know, but God knows whose are his. And the way he knows are his, they depart from iniquity. They don't do things that displease God. So Revelation 9 verse 5 says, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Oh, so these people who are not God's people these demons don't even have these, these fallen angels, whatever they may be, they, they don't even have the authority to kill these people. Their sole purpose is to just torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. That doesn't sound fun. That sounds bad. Interestingly enough, we saw the linkages to where these fallen angels came from, and they're given five months to torment those that are not sealed by God. You know what else lasted five months, 150 days? The flood. From start to finish. 
Do you see how the linkages continue? <clears throat> Isaiah 9.15 says, The elder and the honorable, he is the head. A prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. Isn't it interesting that the tail of the scorpion is what is deadly, and a prophet who teaches lies, he, he's the tail. Ephesians 6.12 tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. I don't know about you, but I've had some times in my life where I feel like I've been under demonic attack, and I've said, oh my gosh, I literally wish I had an enemy I could punch in the face. It'd be so much nicer if I could just actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. In all honesty... These scriptures are making it sound that when the church is out of here and the, and the judgments are being poured out, that could literally be something you have to deal with. These seem like literal supernatural beings that have been able to manifest bodily. I don't think we really want to have to be around when it's possible to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those enemies. That does not sound fun. Perhaps in this judgment season, the invisible forces, forces are unleashed to become much more tangible. Revelation 9, 6. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. They're going to be tormented for five months, and they're going to wish they could die. That is a not fun place to be. What greater torment can there be than to want to die and not be able to? Revelation 9, 7 through 8. Excuse me, I it went two slides. <clears throat> the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. Does that sound like any grasshopper you've ever seen? See, they're described as locusts, but they're not described as locusts. They're described like lo locusts because they come out of that pit like an angry swarm, consuming everything in their path. Remember the verses from Joel that we read. It is like the Garden of Eden in front of them, and it is like the wasteland after them. But they look very different, and that's why this is not a literal interpretation of actual swarms of locusts. In fact, the locust swarms that Egypt saw were pale by comparison. Verse 9 says, And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. That's outrageous. That's crazy. It makes me wish that an allegorical or a symbolic interpretation was valid in this place. Please tell me this is some overwhelming army from some nation that's just demonically motivated. That's not what's being said here. These are supernatural armies. And we've seen them foretold before us. The German term for locust actually is a hay horse, and the Italian term is a little horse. That's what they call them. But these, these are demonic creatures. Even Joel 1.6, a chapter previous to where we looked earlier, it says, For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has fangs of a fierce lion. Now we'll get a better description of that fallen one that we saw earlier as we go to verse 10 of Revelation 9. It says, they had tails like scorpions, and they were st there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months, as if we didn't get it all the first time. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. See, now the star that fell is given a name. And as we'll see when we get to Revelation 12, 
and as we examine Revelation or uh, Genesis six, remember it says that in the days of Noah, there were those who took there there were sons of God who took for themselves daughters of men, wives, whomever they chose, and there were giants in the land in those days, and also after that. It is possible that there are more angels to fall in the future insurrection. It doesn't mean that it's all over. So what does Abaddon mean? Abaddon means destruction or ruin. All that it means is destruction or ruin. And I'm going to show you, it shows up six times in the Hebrew Bible. But Job answered and said, how have you helped him who is without power? How have you saved the arm that has no strength? How have you counseled one who has no wisdom? And how have you declared the sound advice to many? He's speaking here of man's frailty and God's majesty as he responds to his three friends. And then he goes on, he says, to whom have you uttered words and whose spirit came from you? The dead tremble, those under the waters and those inhabiting them, Sheol... The pit is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. It's interesting to me. We think of destruction as just a word there, but destruction has no covering. In Hebrew, that's Abaddon. And I remember reading Ezekiel 28, where the angelic cherub described as falling is said that every precious gemstone is your covering. Isn't it interesting here? Why would destruction have no... What, what does that mean in the sense of just destruction? But if it is Abaddon has no covering, we begin to see maybe something else about the character of this, this person. Now, I'm not saying that's what it means, but it's interesting. <clears throat> Job 28, 22 says, Destruction and death say, We have heard a report about it with our ears. Now, this is interesting because... In this chapter, Job is speaking of wisdom, and he makes destruction and death out to not know the first thing about it. In fact, what destruction or Abaddon and death say about wisdom is the exact same thing that Job has to repent of at the end of the book. I heard about you, God, with the hearing of the ear, but I did not know you. And here we have Abaddon saying he doesn't know the first thing about wisdom. Psalm 88, 1 says, Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Abaddon. Proverbs 15, 11, Hell and Abaddon are before the Lord, so how much more the hearts of the sons of men? Proverbs 27, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Sometimes you can just do a root study and you can get indications of things. doesn't mean you build a whole lot of doctrine around it, but um, this actually up, up here, but this is in the Greek Apollyon in the left section up here, Apollyon. Um, and uh, it means destroyer. And it specifically means the angel of the bottomless pit. It's really only used um, a couple of times. Another time we see the word is in John 10.10. 10. It says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to apollyon. The verb form of that word is used there. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So you see that the linkage here of this fallen angel is linked to the character of the devil in that way. Maybe it is simply the devil. Revelation 9, 12 says, One woe is past, still two more woes are coming after these. Remember, when we got done with the first four trumpets, we entered those verses at the end of Revelation 8 that said three woes. Woe, woe, woe. And it wasn't because somebody was backing up without paying attention to where they were going. It was woe, woe, woe. Three horrible destructions that were coming. All that we just read is the first woe. We have two trumpets left to go, but we'll just do the six this morning. Now, interestingly enough, another reason that we know these are not just regular literal um, locusts coming out of this pit opened in the earth somewhere, as Proverbs 30, 27 tells us, 
that the locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. Well, real locusts have no king. They don't have a queen. They don't have a chief of the hive. They're not like bees, okay? But these locusts that we see in Revelation are very clearly told that they have a king. So it is metaphorical in the sense that they are locusts. They are really supernatural creatures described by all these other means. And we are within our rights to interpret it that way. Amos 7.1 says, Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowing. So that's locust swarms. They, they do that kind of thing. But here's what's really interesting about this verse. If we look at it in the Septuagint version, so that's what's called the LXX, right? The Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Look what Amos 7.1 tells us. The Lord hath shown me, and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming, and behold, one of the young devastating locusts was Gog, the king. Very different translation of that verse. Now, you guys haven't been there because we haven't done a commentary on Ezekiel yet, but there is a battle that comes to Israel, and it is called the Gog and Magog invasion. And it is described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it is a great nation coming against Israel. That is what it is about. And here we have this hint in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that the head of these locusts is in fact Gog the king. That's interesting. That's worth jotting a note down because at some point we're going to come back to that. Let's look at the sixth trumpet, the angel from the Euphrates. <clears throat> Revelation 9, 13 through 14 says, Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. What? So now we find ourselves back at the altar of incense in the heavenly throne room where the saints were crying out, both in Revelation 5 and in, in Revelation, um, uh, the, the opening of the seals, uh, I'm sorry, Revelation 6, and in Revelation 8 at the beginning. And this is what the altar of incense looked like in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle. And you can see in the rightmost picture there, if you look closely, that there's blood upon the horns of the altar. Now, this is a conspicuous thing because blood is only offered in this location of the tabernacle one time a year on the feast of Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is the sixth of the seven feasts of Israel. Happens in October-ish every year. And that is the year where the high priest, after great ceremonial preparation, goes in behind the veil and offers blood on the Ark of the Covenant. One time a year, they, remember, they tie a rope on him in case he dies when he's in there so they can drag him back out. But in this time, he also puts blood upon the horns of the altar. In Yom Kippur, Jews consider that judgment day every year. It is in the prophetic timeline, the day of judgment. So all of these allusions that we are seeing to blood upon the altar of incense in Revelation 8 and following and the prayers of the saints ascending like incense to God, this is coming out of what the Jews would have recognized as judgment day. Because remember, if God didn't accept the sacrifice that was made on judgment day, they were going to be wiped out. There was going to be no next year. They all had you know, the days of awe, they lived in fear. That's why Yom Kippur is the most hallowed day in Israel. You can, you can take a picture of a freeway in Israel today on Yom Kippur, and there is eight lanes of traffic with not a car on it. It is still considered judgment day, and that's the picture of what's going on here in the heavenly realm. This is the fulfillment of the Yom Kippur feast. You can read more about that in Exodus 30, verse 10. And there's that interesting story in 1 Kings 13, 2 through 3, where it's prophesied that Josiah would sacrifice the pagan priests upon the altar's horns and that the very sign that his prophecy would come to pass would be that the altar would split in half. 
Okay. Revelation 9 through 15 says, So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Four angels bound at the river Euphrates. These are apparently wicked angels since they are bound and must be loosed. But remember, all the way back in Revelation 6, 8, and we'll look at it here, it said, And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword and hunger and death and by the beasts of the earth. And that is the fourth horseman, the death in Hades horseman. He killed a quarter of the earth when that horseman was released. And so these four angels are released, and a third of mankind is wiped out because of them. Now, the previous woe, the fifth trumpet woe, wasn't allowed to kill anybody. It was just sheer torment for 150 days. But in this woe, a third of mankind gets wiped out. And I don't know about you, fractions are not my strong suit, but a fourth plus a third means over a half of the human population has been wiped out by this point. That does not sound like fun. Here's another thing I want to show you. What you're looking at in that map that I have on the screen, the rightmost line, in fact, I'll draw on it for just, a, just so you can see, this line that is coming down here, that line there, that's the Euphrates River, okay? And that is the real eastern border of the Promised Land. Now, do you know why that's significant? Because Israel... Israel is that little blue spot. This is Israel, right there. Would you say that they're living up to the borders of what was promised to them? Let me show you what I'm talking about. Joshua 1.4 says, From the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, that's the Mediterranean, that shall be your territory. And in case you missed it with that verse, in Genesis 15, 18, God says to Abraham, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Well, the river of Egypt is the Nile, and that's the leftmost line on the map. So Israel's true borders are from the Nile to the Euphrates, according to God. And they're getting asked to give up land for peace. Just saying. Now, a divided kingdom cannot stand, and the Euphrates appears to be a division in Satan's kingdom. Because as far as Asia is concerned, demonic religions are all east of the Euphrates. India is said to have 33 million gods. And according to Psalm 96.5, in the Septuagint, all the gods of the heathen, if you read it in your Bible, it's going to say all the gods of the heathen are idols. But the Septuagint version says all the gods of the heathen are demons. 33 million Revelation 9, 16 through 17 says, that Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. So these four angels get released from where they were bound for the month, the week, the day, the hour. Wherever they're at by the Euphrates River. And they come with an army of 200 million whatever. 200 million. That is two-thirds of the American population. Yikes. Yikes. I heard the number of them, and I thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouth came fire, smoke, and brimstone. Difficulties with passages like this only arise from a lack of belief. Demonic forces are at work here. 
Revelation 9, 18 through 19 says, By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. The Bible treats that like three plagues. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads. These things are described like literal chimeras, lions with serpent tails. Having heads and with them they do harm. Closing out the chapter it says, <clears throat> But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. Everybody say, did not repent. Of the works of their hands. That they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. They did not repent. So these judgments are not remedial. They're not meant to cure. They're retribution or retributive ju judgments. They, they, God is aware that these men will not repent of their sins. Romans 3.11 says, There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. And the king of these beasts, the king of these... He, 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 the Hebrew may be saying that Abaddon, he doesn't know the first thing about wisdom. Well, let me tell you what. If I was a person and I saw all of that happening, I think I would have a hard time getting up off my knees. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 21 says, What am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything. Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. The insanity of worshiping gods that are not and the demons that are. Idols can include the work of their own hands, buildings, machines, cities. This is dead sinners worshiping dead gods. And Psalms 135.18 tells us we become like what we believe and worship. So to close it out, let's just think of some characteristics of today. It says, and they did not repent of their murders, sorceries, sexual immorality, or thefts. Today, we even subsidize murders prior to birth. And we're unrepentant. In Greek, pharmakia is the word for sorcery. It's where we get our word pharmacology, the use of their drugs. Well, I don't know about you right now, but we seem to have a drug being forced down our throats, right? Sexual immorality is the preoccupation of today's culture. We live in a culture today where Christians would rather live together to get, than get married because it saves on rent. We don't keep our promises or our oaths before the Lord because we don't take what He hates seriously. And the seal of God that we saw was depart from iniquity. Yes, following God, my friends, is going to complicate your life. It may bring hardship. Tithing in tough times may compli uh, complicate your life. But it is to acknowledge your dependence on God. Fasting in hard times may complicate your life. But it's to deny self. To say, I'm not going to be ruled by the ways of this world. I'm going to do it God's way. And I tell you what, we want to be repentant now. Then we have theft. And theft can mean in institutional theft as well as individual theft. And you know what? We, our government is trying to steal from us. Our government wants to send $3 trillion to other countries. Of our money. We have to be thinking about what comes next. So these are the five judgments we've seen so far. 
While the first four seem to be natural, you can see that the next two were clearly demonic in nature. One third of the grass and trees burned, the mountain of fire and one third of the sea, wormwood, one third of the fresh waters turned bitter, darkness and one third of the sun, moon and stars go out, then demon locusts. Euphrates, angels, and one-third of men slain. And then, of course, as with all of these sevens, we're going to come to a parenthesis where in the next two chapters, Revelation 10 and Revelation 11, we're going to see a mighty angel with a little book and the two witnesses. But the parenthesis is going to last all the way through chapter 14. So we're entering a phase of parenthesis again, like chapter 7 was a parenthesis to the seals. Remember, all of these trumpets are the seventh seal. So with that said, here's your homework for next time. Read Revelation 10 and 11. Who are the two witnesses? Not woe are the two witnesses. And then justify your answers with scriptures. Try to come up with who they are based on scripture. And then we're also going to encounter these seven thunders. But what's interesting about these seven thunders is John goes to write them down and somebody goes, no, stop. Don't write that. That's not yet to be revealed. We've got seven seals, seven trumpets. Later on, we're going to have seven bowls. But there's also seven trumpets. And we don't even get to know what they are. Seven thunders. We don't even get to know what they are. Isn't that interesting? So why do you think they are not recorded? And with that, everybody pray for Michelle because she's going to have a heck of a time piecing this one together. Let's take a break.